uh, than um, uh, many other types of meteors. So yeah, it was, a, and Kelly said it was a kind of a moon, there was a moon after, the moon rose after midnight, but I'm sure that probably didn't interfere too much. I'm gonna start with some announcements. So let me work on sharing my screen. You see a announcement slide. Says I'm sharing. Do you see an announcement slide? I do. Oh yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so um, there's been continued discussion about the meeting format for the upcoming meetings, and today is obviously a Zoom only. Good day to do that with the the weather. So. Good example of that. Um, in April, we'll start to do some hybrids and possibly some in-person only, possibly for the, um, particularly for the salons. But uh, the board is meeting next week and we'll discuss this further and we'll keep you posted on that. Um, upcoming deadlines for a couple of contests. So the N4C contest deadline is January 10. And the day after that, the deadline is for the hour salon. The assignment is the golden hour. Um, then Wednesday, January 18th, we've got the 2022 year end awards. That'll be by Zoom. Um, and the first Wednesday for February happens to be February 1, so that'll be the salon meeting. And then the mid-month meeting, we'll have Terry Butler telling us about black and white photography. Uh, I do have other dates that are on the calendar, but I'm not gonna go through those right now. But that's the the upcoming oh. information. Uh, inform any other announcements for anyone or questions? Well, I have a, I have a couple I'd like to bring up. Uh, uh -huh. The interclub competition is coming up, uh, and I I don't have the uh, the date uh, that you have to send in uh, assignments or your uh, your your the, your photos. It's going to be I think probably the middle of this month. Okay. Um, and, uh, I think I sent something out about that. Oh, uh, weeks ago, and maybe I'll send that out again because I encourage our members to enter those competitions mm -hmm. and along with the N4C contest deadline on January 10th, um, uh, our club, because we, we judged nature in November, um, we can double enter this month. And because um, the images that we sent in for travel in November didn't get judged, we can double enter uh, travel images this month. So, wow. um, so uh, you know, uh, look for some uh, nature and travel images that you have, and make sure that you send those to um, ten no send those to Ken Walter. Great. And that's it. Okay. Mike, I just made you in charge. Okay. Everybody mute if you're not muted already. We only want to hear from Mike for the moment. It's always, very, it's always a little scary. <laughs> Steve, let me know when you're ready. I'll just go. Go ahead. 
All right, well, uh, welcome everyone. And thanks so much for uh, joining us this evening for our introduction on uh, introduction to nightscapes. And, um, you know, just uh, before we get started, I just wanted to say thanks again to, uh, to Steve and to Terry and to all the other folks at the Western Wisconsin Photography Club for a, another chance to present. Uh, this is, I think, my third or fourth uh, version of this, um, uh, the different types of presentations. And I always just really appreciate it because it's, um, it's near and dear to my heart. And I just appreciate the chance for you folks to uh, take some time out of your night to, uh, to, to you know, spend with us this evening. Super informal guy. Um, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to ask at any time because um, if you have a question, somebody else does too. And you can ask the question in the chat box or you can just uh, interrupt me at any time. It's totally fine. Please don't wait till the end because by then we'll have lost the momentum and the, uh, and the, and the and stream of thought and stuff like that. So, um, and also if you have any questions, uh, my email, just email me at any time. It's super easy to remember. It's my first name, which is Mike at MikeShawPhotography.com. And uh, with that, I'll go ahead and just uh, launch into the, uh, the presentation. I'm going to take a moment here and hope that the technology gods all come together on this. Um, so I'm going to do that. And oh, I need to hang on just one second. I just forgot to share my screen. So let's do that. So let's do this. So hopefully you can see that. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Okay. That's a great start. I'm using a slightly different setup tonight. So this is um, this version of this slide. And this is what I really wanted to use. So introduction to nightscapes, Western Wisconsin Photography Club. And today's day. can't believe it's 2023. I thought by now we'd be zipping around on jetpacks. And I'm still waiting for mine to, uh, to arrive. But in any event, so one of the themes for tonight is, let me just... Uh, um, I'm going to stop sharing that for a second. One of the themes for tonight, and this is something that I feel kind of uh, passionate about or, or you know, strongly or, or personal importance to me, is that when people contemplate, um, you know, astronomy has become a, such a space, has become such a big uh, item in the news of late. You know, we've had all the, uh, the SpaceX, the, you know, Jeff Bezos, Blue Origin, uh, commercial space flights, the transition from, you know, government NASA to commercial space flights. And that's going to only continue at different countries, you know, China, India, in addition to the US and Russia, uh, different consortia are launching um, missions to the moon and to Mars and, and beyond. And it's, it's a really exciting time. I mean, there was quite a while there, just 20 or so years when none of this was happening. And it's like, okay, what's this going to pick back up? <laughs> Excuse me. And so one of the features of this is this interest in being an astronaut. You know, it's like, man, it'd be great to be an astronaut. I was, I remember seeing the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the Apollo launches when I was a kid on my family's black and white TV screen. And it's always been kind of an interesting thing to me. It's like, what would it like to be an astronaut? And the reason I'm bringing this up and how it relates to tonight's topic is that you are an astronaut already. And so part of my thing for tonight is to convince you of that very fact. So uh, I'm going to go back now to the, uh, so as, as, a, as a segue from that into our, into the, um, into that topic, this is a time-lapse um, sequence from, you can see the fireflies buzzing around there. This is from the Boundary Waters Canoe Area Wilderness. And the way this was put together, here comes the Milky Way. <clears throat> Sometimes it's easy to forget that the earth and us along with it are the thing that's moving through space, not the other way around. And every time you go out at night when it's clear and you can see the stars or anything, you can see all the satellites as well, you're looking into space no differently, that your view is no different than the view of the astronauts aboard the International Space Station. So we can talk a little bit more about that, but that was certainly something that I felt was an important thing to keep in mind as you go through this journey of nightscape photography, you know, nightscapes and landscape astrophotography, however you want to call it. So what is a nightscape? Um, uh, image and this is a classic example. You can't see any stars. It's done during the blue hour, you know, uh, civil twilight, going into nautical twilight. This is a friends of ours. Is, I was doing an engagement session up near Duluth. You can see the aerial lift bridge right here on the screen if you look very very carefully. And so a nightscape is anything that has an interesting night sky with an interesting foreground. So it's kind of like uh, you know night 
landscape photography, if you will. It's all about the story of the night sky and our view of it from Earth. So there's a lot of latitude. And I thought what I'd do tonight is start off by introducing you to something beyond the Milky Way. I mean, sort of people think of nightscape photography and they immediately go to, oh, he's talking about the Milky Way. There's a lot more that goes on in the night sky. Uh, and especially us in Minnesota, we have access to a number of things, notably the Aurora Borealis, that a lot of people in the world really don't have it in their backyard. And so obviously the Milky Way is a really classic example. This is a, one of the first things that people think of. It's kind of a low-res version of this. I didn't realize that I came across this uh, so you can see the, the grain and stuff. But in any event, so this is the the sort of the classic view of the Milky Way over some mountains in California. And it's a beautiful thing to see. I mean, there's just so many things to see in this view of the Milky Way. There's these different colored stars, there's these dark regions, there's these fuzzy bright patches that you can see perhaps. And, you know, if you have a pair of binoculars, I mean, it's a lifetime of exploration. Uh, so the Milky Way is certainly a classic example, but here's a, a constellation of Orion, which you can make out in the North Windows Arch in Arches National Park in Utah. Mm -hmm. And this is a, there's a really interesting story. I'm not going to tell it now about this uh, lovely couple that I had the good fortune to meet during the shot. But this is um, just one example of there's 88 constellations in the night sky all around the, uh, in, the, in, you know, in, the, in the cosmos, many of which we can't see from the Northern Hemisphere. But Orion's certainly one of them, and it's visible now. It's a great time of year to, to view Orion and the different colored stars and the gas nebulae in Orion. And to sort of juxtapose it, you know, cultures around the world have connected with Orion a lot of times as a human figure. And, um, you know, it's just a, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing to see. But look here, look at this. This is something that, you know, people, most people haven't seen this. And I'd be willing to bet that a good number of you here in the Western Wisconsin Photography Club have actually, at some point in your life, witnessed the Aurora Borealis, maybe when you were growing up or as an adult or, or whatever. But it's one of these beautiful natural phenomena that's just so striking. And sometimes we forget how mesmerizing and hypnotic a good Aurora display can be. And I'm here to tell you that right now, the next three or four years is a peak time in the solar cycle to view the aurora borealis if you um and it doesn't happen in the wind only in the, it happens 365 you know 7 24 7 365 if you will it happens you know throughout the year uh, one of the most vivid aurora displays that i remember seeing was on the summer solstice the shortest night of the year in the in wisconsin in the apostle islands as it turns out in 2015 june 21st of 2015 my father and I and I were uh, boat. We were camping on one of the Apostle Islands. Incredible display of the aurora. Shortest nights. You came out around 11:30 midnight. That's when it got dark. But this is something to certainly keep on your calendar. And if you know, if you has been a while since you've seen this, you know the next. You know, as I say, the next couple of years, I can talk more about this if you like. Are a great time to um, to see the aurora. This is a shot from basically downtown Minneapolis. This is Star Trails um, uh, image. And as you can see here, um, there's a, just, I don't know, dozens, maybe hundreds, perhaps, of stars. And the motion that you see of these are the apparent motion is actually, of course, the result of the Earth's rotation from the, if you think back to that opening time lapse when the Earth was, when you could see that, you could actually could see the Earth rotating, was well, the Earth rotates around its axis each night, the stars appear to move and Star Trail images are so easy to make and they're so much fun and powerful and mesmerizing. It looks like a time warp out of a science fiction movie or something, but this was done in October. Uh, it was uh, a, nearly a full moon, which is why the, the, four, the trees are so brightly lit by the moonlight. And you can see the leaves on the foreground and everything like that. So star trails are a lot of fun, but also how about planets? Okay, so look at this. So I don't know if you can see, um, I think you folks, and, oops, didn't mean to do that, come back here. So I think you folks can see my cursor, but this planet right here is Venus. And that's cool enough by itself. You can see its reflection here. But if you see this reflection right here, this very faint one, that's the planet Mercury. So think about that. That's Mercury and that's Venus. And here's Earth. We're on Earth, obviously, in case you forgot. And so these are the three innermost planets. I mean, the other than that's the sun. And it's just incredible to think about how small these things are. And the, you know, think of the solar system as this like big, you know, complex structure. Well, these planets are really far apart. And uh, yet you can see them. You can actually see Mercury with your unaided eye. You can see Venus easily. 
And Jupiter right now is very visible. Mars is visible. I think Saturn's kind of gone for a little while. But anyway, the bright planets are visible not only from a rural location like this. This is actually from Crex Meadows, again in Wisconsin. A lot of really dark skies in Wisconsin. But you can also see these bright planets from downtown Minneapolis. They're so bright uh, that they kind of pierce through that, that uh, light, that bright lights, the bright city lights. Now, uh, planets are, the moon is a satellite, the uh, planets are a satellite. This is the International Space Station itself, this bright reflection. This is back in Minnesota. And this was a, um, I think this was a single exposure. I'm trying to remember. I think this was a single exposure of several minutes watching the, uh, it, the, the space station appeared at the lower right here. And then it gradually just, you know, just moves overhead. And if you've never seen this, it's surprisingly easy to, surprisingly common, first of all. And second of all, it's surprisingly easy to, uh, to find a prediction for if it's going to happen. Um, in fact, let me just pull up my app here to have a quick look to see if there's any International Space Station. So let's have a quick current location. Boom, next 20, next seven days. Look at that, on January 5th at 6.40 a.m., if it's clear. Oh, look at this, January 6th at 5.54 a.m. It's a really gonna be a bright one. Um, yeah, so anyway, um, I didn't plan to do that, but yeah, the International Space Station. And it's amazing, you can see this thing. It's just this bright dot of light that slowly moves by overhead. You can actually watch it move. And it's visible for several minutes before it disappears into the Earth's shadow. So that's something to, to look for. This is another type of a satellite. This is not so much visible with your unaided eye, but uh, sometimes you can see them, actually. But this phenomenon is, I think of it as a cosmic disco ball, because you have this satellite with these giant you know, solar panels that reflect sunlight. And as they're turning, um, they kind of spin in space. And as they spin in space, they reflect a little beam of sunlight that we see. And so that's kind of a neat thing. It's kind of a, you know, more of a, a oddity than anything else. But have a look at this one. Um, so this is uh, a comet. First of all, this was Comet Neowise in the summer of 2020 and cool enough by itself. But here's the Big Dipper. And I think you probably know that the Big Dipper itself is part of the constellation Ursa Major. And I've outlined the big bear, the great bear. So many other cultures, again, have connected with the great bear Ursa Major around the world. And what's nice about the Big Dipper is, in particular is that it is, it never sets. It's it is, as the it sort of, it goes around the North Star. These two stars right here, as you probably know, are called the pointer stars. They point over here towards the North Star, excuse me. And as the Earth rotates, the way where this is located in the sky, it never goes below the horizon. Sometimes it skims the, it skims the, the northern horizon, but it never goes below it. So it's always visible. You can always see the Big Dipper um, if it's clear. Uh, this is an example of the Milky Way in its full glory over Split Rock Lighthouse. You can see the lighthouse right just here. This right here is actually the moon coming up. It's rising in the east roughly. And this was shot around two o'clock in the morning in May, in early May. So this is, this orange glow is from the sunlight, that's from the sun that's going to rise in a while, but it hasn't actually appeared above the horizon yet. This is the moon. This is the Milky Way. You can see some interesting pink patches in the Milky Way. I mean, there's just, we could talk for a long time about this image by itself. You can see the Andromeda galaxy right here. That's out past the, uh, past the Milky Way. Whoops. Um, and then a little surprise here was this little <laughs> bonus uh, Aurora Borealis display. That wasn't part of the plan either. But every time you go out at night, there's always a surprise. You always run into interesting people, interesting animals, <laughs> interesting something um, when you're out shooting at night. So it's just it's just a lot of fun. This was from uh, the full moon. is just a great thing to watch. This was from um, this last year. Is I think it was August, perhaps. I think this was from August of 2022. Well, I guess last year now. And this was in White Bear Lake. It was, uh, you know, I was watching this, you know, I had the tele or the camera set up. I think the moon's going to come out from behind the clouds. And sure enough, it did. And <laughs> I was wearing one of these photographs, this delightful stuff. I just had a friend's game busting through the image on their motorboats. So that was kind of a fun, fun surprise. But there's something about watching the full moon when you're a little bit familiar with it uh, coming up from behind the horizon because it's just so bright compared to everything else. Even if it's a little bit cloudy, it's, it's, it, the moon still manages to bust through the clouds. And 
I just find, I just think there's something, I don't know, it's reassuring, especially given all the things that are happening in the world these days, to just know that the full moon is going to rise in the east on schedule and where you expect it to rise. But also the crescent moon. This is from Linwood Lake in Minnesota. This is the crescent moon setting uh, over the lake. It's just a beautiful, uh, beautiful sight to see. This is a lunar eclipse. We have a, a lunar eclipse coming up. Um, oh man, I'm all of a sudden mixing up my years. I'm pretty sure we have, no, actually, wait, I don't think we do have a lunar eclipse coming up for several years now that I think about it. I think it was last year. Anyway, uh, when they do a next one, when the next one does come around, it's really cool to watch because you have this scenario when you have this full moon, which is, as I say, super bright in the sky. And then all of a sudden over, well, not all of a sudden, but gradually over the course of an, an hour or so, a couple hours sometimes, it just gradually, as it slides into the Earth's shadow, everything gets dark and it's very, very eerie and mysterious. You feel like impending doom, like something bad about to happen, but then it gets kind of neat. And then all of a sudden it starts to get bright again. It's like, what just happened? So lunar eclipses are pretty cool things to watch. And then not to, you know, humble brag about the forthcoming new book, The Beginner's Guide to Astrophotography, but the kind of the cutting edge of um, <laughs> beginning, beginning astrophotography or nightscapes is, the, is called Deepscape photography where you have a deep sky object like this molecular cloud this is a single shot uh, well actually it's a blend of two shots but the same camera same lens in effect a single shot same focal length of this deep sky object setting behind Lone Pine Peak in California when you can see a little bit of a uh, the, the road underneath there so what I wanted to do is this is an outline for today's uh, for tonight's talk so I just talked about a bunch of different nightscape examples you know different types of things and there's different you know branches we could go down in each one of those, you know, different types of star trails and different compass directions, you know, different types of lens choice for the Aurora and camera settings. Next thing I want to do is to spend a little bit of time talking about, um, you know, gear and camera settings and exposure settings. When I say camera settings, it's uh, things like white balance and, you know, file format and stuff like that. And exposure settings, so we're, we're talking about the ISO and the f-stop and the shutter speed, stuff that you're familiar with as photographers. Um, and then two of the things that are really tricky are focusing in the dark and composing in the dark. So I want to spend a little bit of time with that. Then I also added a little bonus section on planning using uh, different apps on your smartphone, because there's been a lot of progress in the last several years in particular on the development of these apps that really make your life so simple. And as I say, it's kind of fun because especially with the clouds, you can actually sort of virtually live through these different astronomical events, um, even if they don't actually get to see them. So it's kind of like a vicarious uh, virtual uh, experience, if you will. But let's, let's talk a little bit about gear and camera settings for, uh, you know, for nightscape photography, for night photography. And you, you most likely have what you need, you know, not only to get started, but to actually do some pretty advanced uh, projects, most of which I just showed you. We could do most of the projects I just showed you. Um, you, a camera body, a lens. I'm going to talk a little bit about different types of lens, focal length lenses and what you use them for. And then a ball head and a tripod. And that's it. I mean, you don't need a fancy telescope or a tracker or, you know, a lot of times people getting into night photography, like, well, Mike, I heard a lot of these star trackers. And I was like, you don't know, you don't need one. I'm going to talk about them in a minute, but you certainly don't need that. But just simply, um, this is it. I mean, just anything you'd use to do wildlife photography or portrait photography or any type of macro photography even is great for night photography. You don't need to get a special night photography camera or night photography lens, especially when you're getting started. So here's a few things that are also, these are things I take with me every time I go out. The first thing you must have is a red headlamp. There's just no, no ifs, ands, and buts. It, um, it's good for your night vision. It helps you see where you're going because if it's since it's on your head if you've never used a headlight it's kind of miraculous especially as one goes through the events of the day <laughs> uh you know um it's always pointing where you're looking so it's super handy it's not like you have to stick your flashlight in your mouth or anything like that and it also saves the night vision of everybody else and this is a big deal because uh, especially if you go to an astronomical event like a star party people are um somewhat uh <laughs> militant about you know white lights versus red lights so always be, be sure to have a red headlamp and you'll immediately recognize the benefits i was recently at a talk and someone i don't know if this is a, a real thing or not but someone was saying that um you know this is like uh many people have said that the x y and z but that the uh, reason that our we don't mind 
red light is because it's the same color as like embers in a fire. And so if we're out, you know, for cave people back in the day and we're trying to see, you know, things that are going to kill us at night, you know, and we're looking, we're usually sitting around a fire. And so I, I don't know if there's any of that makes sense, but it's an interesting hypothesis. But anyway, you need a red headlight. And this is what it looks like in the field. This is me. I had a, this is doing it by myself. I had another camera set up to take a picture of this for this purpose. But here I am uh, in a wildlife management area. And it's kind of interesting because if you look at this, this is done under a full moon. And I was um, vainly hoping to catch some, uh, there's a, there's supposed to be a, this is several years ago, and there was supposed to be a, a significant display of the aurora that totally didn't happen, but I got a great star trail image out of it. And um, but this is what the setup looks like. I actually had two cameras set up there. Their tripod legs are overlapping because I was trying to not have each camera be in the other camera's shot. There's this narrow little walkway on each side. There's a, there's a wildlife management area. So on either side of this, it's just uh, cattail marshes. It's, I mean, people go canoeing there, they go duck hunting and stuff. But um, in any event, there it is. I mean, it's just this real simple setup. Like I say, you probably have this setup if you're, you're part of the you know, photography club. Oh, I see someone put something in the chat. Let's see if it's a new comment. Oh, uh, this is someone sent a question to me. What was the shutter speed in the Arches National Park shot? I believe that was a either 10 or 20 second shutter speed. And so I had to tell the people to not move for 10 or 20 seconds. They did a pretty good job of that. So uh, hopefully um, that answers the question about that. So if that doesn't, please do let me know though. And we can talk more about that. Okay, so... Um, Okay, so we've got the there's a basic, real basic setup. Let's talk about a, a few things that are um, important, though. Now that we've uh, established that, and the two things that you have to have on your camera is the ability is a manual focus and a manual exposure. And again, you as photographers have this, I'm sure. Excuse me. The manual focus is just what, what exactly what it sounds like, and the manual exposure is again what it sounds like. And the reason for both of these is that the focusing apparatus in your camera relies on a, a light sensor, as does the manual exposure. And for whatever reason, there's been a lot of improvements lately, but still in the majority of cases, the light meter just doesn't function at night in low light conditions, it just fails. And so if you're trying to shoot something in aperture priority, for example, or shutter priority, or either auto mode or anything like that, it just can't do it. And the same thing goes for the focusing system. I mean, especially when you're trying to focus on the stars, which I'll get to in a minute, one of the most important things, it just, uh, just is, it's a non-starter. And so you, uh, the, one of the key things we're gonna talk about this is learning how to focus your camera you know, at night and then learning how to compose um, at night as well. So we're gonna spend a, um, a decent amount of time talking about that. I'm just looking and making sure I'm not missing anything on the, uh, I, I kind of lost the chat screen. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, so manual exposure, manual focus, good to go. All right, what else? Let's go back to here. Um, so let's talk through the basic camera settings. I'm just going to uh, list them out here. Manual focus, manual exposure. You want to make sure your auto IS, these are all things that on different workshops um, that I taught, uh, people have run into problems. Uh, you want to make sure the auto ISO is off. And this is a kind of a tricky one because it's not a common thing to change because usually it's not an issue, but at night it really is. So you want to make sure your auto ISO is off so that you're manually controlling your ISO. And you want to set your white balance to daylight. You can actually set your white balance to cloudy or incandescent or anything you want. Just don't have it on auto white balance. That's the main thing. So it's like auto ISO is <laughs> manual focus, manual exposure, manual ISO, manual white balance, manual everything. Um, and daylight's a pretty good place to start because the night sky really does have a similar um, color as uh, a daylight uh, night sky. Uh, in turn, there's, this other, there's this other feature called long exposure noise reduction, which is a good thing to have, except when you're impatient like me and you're just anxious to get as many shots as you can. So uh, I would just recommend switching that off. All it does is if you take like a 10, if you take an, an exposure, with a shutter speed that's one second or longer, like two seconds or five seconds or 20 seconds, after you take that shot, your camera takes a second shot, but it doesn't open up the shutter. And then it kind of analyzes that second shot. And if there's anything funky going on with it, it fixes it. You can do all that in Lightroom. And so, like I say, if you leave that on, you're stuck with this, you know, 
dead time of ha of twice as many you know it's the, the <laughs> every time you take a shot you have a, a sort of a dead time of the same amount of time and it drives me nuts so i, I turn that off and then of course you're using a raw file format not just using jpegs i know that you know that as a photographer so i just thought i'd say this now here's here's where things get a little interesting let's talk about the exposure settings a lot of variability here i'm going to talk about that this is if you're in a dark spot, you know, Crex Meadows or um, someplace like that, that's reasonably dark under a moonless sky. There's no moon. There's no snow. It's dark. Um, this is a pretty good set of comedy of settings to have. It's kind of the golden combination. 3200 ISO f-stop of 4.0 or lower if you can 2.8. I usually shoot pretty much wide open and then a shutter speed of 10 to 20 seconds. And, you know, each one of these three parameters has issues, <laughs> as they say. So if you go too high of an ISO, you're going to, yes, you're going to have noise. There's nothing you can do about that. And if you shoot wide open, you're going to have, you know, coma and vignetting and all sorts of horrible things. And if you shoot for the shutter speed of too long, you're going to have star trailing. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about that. So the star trailing issue is, oh, I was going to, maybe I'll talk about that. I'll come back to that in a second. So the, I'll come to this in a, in a bit, but um it's kind of like you want as much light as you possibly can. And so night photographers end up pushing the limits of their gear in a way that gets them to a point where bad things start to happen. And then they back off from that just a little bit. And the thing is that the level at which bad things start to happen is kind of a subjective personal choice things. So if you have a, like I have a height, I have a pretty decent tolerance for noise. So I don't mind shooting at 12,800. Other people just cannot tolerate that. And so it's, like I say, it's a personal thing. I'm going to give you some examples of that in a bit. But first, let's talk about lenses before we, come, before we deep dive into that. So, I mean, literally every lens that you have, you can use for night photography. Here's a fisheye lens of the Milky Way over Split Rock Lighthouse, a different night than the one I showed you a minute ago. Here you can see the Milky Way straight overhead. There's so many things to see in this particular shot. Um, but there it is. Uh, you know, wide angle lens. This is a 14 millimeter lens. It's great for capturing the whole big regions of the sky. Again, this is looking due north in uh, the Alabama hills in California. So this is a 14, a 14 millimeter lens. This is a 24 millimeter lens. I think the 24 or 35. Again, this shows Orion, constellation Orion over the uh, Eastern Sierra. Right now, the Eastern Sierra looks a lot different than this because they just got dumped with you know, I don't know how many feet of snow right now, which is great. They really need it, but you can see the, I can see the constellation Orion. I don't know if you can see this, but right here, this is the Rosette Nebula. It's a little star forming region. It's a great thing to view through binoculars really, or maybe a telescope. Um, but again, back to the constellation of Orion. I don't know if you can see it. There's also this enormous pink, pale pink. I don't know if it comes across in zoom or not. This pale pink, um, you know, semicircle that is what people think is left of a supernova explosion many, many, well, a long time ago, I'll leave it at that. Now, this is, again, back in the Landscape Arboretum, uh, Minnesota Landscape Arboretum. I'm going to be teaching some more. This is one of my uh, full moon classes I teach over there, and I've got some of these coming up in uh, 2023. So if you're interested in joining me out there for a full moon extravaganza, uh, check out the Arboretum's website, and you can sign up there. And this is a this is a single exposure. It's not a composite. Um, this was shot with a, I think this was shot with a 500 millimeter lens. I and mean, the 200 millimeters is a little bit of a, a disclaimer here, but the point is um, you can really, uh, you know, telephoto all the way to fisheye. There's something you can shoot um, with every lens. And it's just really a matter of thinking about the different variety of subjects you are to shoot, you know, time of year, all that sort of stuff. And then choosing a lens, just like any other type of photography. This is a, uh, an example going from a 16 millimeter rectilinear fisheye fish in the top left to the 105 millimeter macro lens at the bottom right. And, you know, it really depends on what your composition, what type of composition you're looking for. If you want to showcase the band of the Milky Way, then you want to have like a wider angle lens. And if you want to really zoom in on a star field, then of course you want to have more of a telephoto lens. So. And with a little bit of experience in the planning apps, I'm about to, I'll tell you about in a minute, you can really dial this in so that it's, um, there's, there's nothing left to chance. And that's one of the things I also want to say, maybe tangentially at this stage, is that night photography is a little frustrating. I mean, there's not a lot of chances to practice it here compared to, let's say, Tucson, Arizona, where it's clear most of the time. And it's done at night and it's cloudy a lot of times. It's, um, it's late. Uh, you know, there's the seasonality of things. And so... 
you know, I just I just wanted to acknowledge that because the rewards are out there, but certainly it is a um, <laughs> there is a bit of a learning curve involved, and you know, myself and other people can help with that. But um, so let's just revisit some of these shots that we looked at a minute ago with what we just talked about. So this was a 14 millimeter shot. This is that one with the tumbling satellite. And you can um, shoot, this is a, again, that showcases the Milky Way and you can shoot this anytime from April through August, or even later than that. This is kind of a very conservative range of dates, uh, but this was shot with a 14 millimeter lens and ISO of 8,000, F3.5 for 20 seconds. There you go. Um, and that's what you get. This was from Solana State Forest. Uh, it's north of the Twin Cities, about 100 miles. And all of that light that you can see on the horizon is the light from the Twin Cities shining upwards and then reflecting down off the clouds. Uh, so if the clouds weren't there, you'd see a little bit more of the Milky Way, but they are there and they're, they're reflecting the light of the, of the, of the cities. Uh, constellations, here's that shot of uh, you know Ursa Major again. This was a 24 millimeter lens. This is a great lens choice for constellations. ISO 5000 f 4.5 for 20 seconds. Um, and if you look, if you, if, if, you know, again, if you zoom in super critically at this length, this shutter speed at this focal length, you're probably going to see a little bit of star motion, but it's not bad if you take the whole big picture like that. And again, you can see some lightning bugs, fireflies down in the bottom right hand corner there. So there's that. Uh, this shot, this is the one that I was setting up where I was telling you about a minute ago into the full moon. This was several hours, I think four or five hours worth of uh, overall exposure. Again, 14 millimeters, ISO 3200, F3.5. And in yes. this case, oh, um, question? Whoopsie. Nope, okay. Uh, in this case, I was using a five second um, shutter speed per image because again, I was hoping to capture the Aurora and it just didn't happen, but I was able to stitch them all together into this uh, star trail image. So we can talk a little bit more about that uh, as the need arises. All right, so um, full moon, here's an interesting tip. So if you wanna shoot the full moon, check this out. The best night to shoot the full moon is often the night before the full moon. And he's like, wait a minute, well, it's not full. It's like, well, yeah, okay, yeah, it's not exactly full, but it's sort of like intents and purposes, it's, it's full. I mean, it's like 98.8% full. I mean, if you look at it, it looks pretty full. And the night before the full moon, when it rises, it rises a little earlier in the evening. And that's important because then you have the best chance of capturing it um, during civil twilight in the 10 or 15 minutes right after sunset. And the same thing goes when the full moon sets right uh, before sunrise, the day after the full moon. So the more, I'm sorry, the morning after the full moon. So the, the show shooting the full moon, Mike, when's the best time to do that? The night before the full moon, the morning after the full moon. So if the full moon was tonight, today, uh, what's today's date? January the 4th. Last night would have been the good night to shoot the full moon in the evening, and tomorrow morning would be the best time to shoot it in the morning, give or take. Again, you want to look up the details of these things, but that's how that goes. 500 millimeters, there you go. ISO 1000. Nice. Hello? A question? Nope, just overhearing thing. And then look at this short shutter speed, a 320th of a second. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this. The shutter speed, um, kind of keeping an eye on the time here. So you're going to hear this, if you get into night photography, you're going to hear people talking about the rule of 500 or the rule of 300 or whatever. And it's a pretty helpful thing. And what it does is it tells you what is the longest shutter speed you can use without seeing the stars move. I mean, if you think about it, the stars are moving. So if you have like a half hour shutter speed, you're going to see them you know, moving during that half hour. And this becomes an issue, especially with telephoto lenses, as you can imagine, because you're looking at a narrower section of the sky, so you're going to see that motion more easily. And so that's, and you're right, that's, you can see what the, the formula says. You basically literally take the number 300. That's how it is. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. You take the number 300 and you divide that by your lens focal length in millimeters. Boom. The number you get is the maximum shutter seed. Here's an example. 50 millimeter lens. Okay, 
I'll take 300. I, I chose this because I can usually do this if I'm presenting in front of a person in front of a large group. I can do this math and math without screwing it up. So you take 300 and you divide that 300 by 50, and it gives you six seconds. And so um, that's not terribly long. Yeah, you know, we were talking about 20 seconds a, se a little while ago. And this is why these wide angle lenses, 14 millimeters, 24 millimeters are good because you can have long shutter speeds and not worry about these, um, you know, this, this issue of star trailing. And so it's like, well, wait a second, Mike, you were just talking about using these super long lenses and stuff. I'm like, yeah, that's, well, there's, there's a, <laughs> there's, there's a, there's a, a, a bit of gear we're going to talk about. That's, that is where star trackers come in, but you can actually get by even with, um, you know, a 200 millimeter lens, 150 millimeter focal length, you can still have, um, you know, one or two or five second exposures and have them be okay. So uh, the main thing is just giving it a try. But I did want to bring this up because um, this question gets asked a lot is what is the, what's the rule of five, 300, rule of five? It used to be the rule of 500, but um, cameras are better now, basically, and people are more picky. And so, uh, We've, yeah, we've got to bring that number down to uh, from 500 down to 300. And in fact, if you want to get super picky, sometimes I'll use uh, 100. But the, the, at the end of the day, what you want to do is something like this. And I'm going to leave this up for a second. I got three of these to show you. And this one's from downtown Minneapolis. And basically, you know, what I would recommend doing is it's, I mean, each place you go to is different, really, really different. There's going to be different city lights, there's going to be different ambient lights, um, there's going to be a different city on the horizon, there's going to be snow, no snow, it's going to be a lake, <coughs> excuse me, no lake, um, it's going to be the moon, maybe there's no moon, just you got to try stuff out, and what I've done here in this particular instance, I mean, I wouldn't do this every single night at all, but you just, you know, set your aperture at something, hey, and um, hey, let's go outside, Oh, question about from Brian about the rule of 300. Excellent question, Brian. So let me go back to uh, the, so this question about the rule, does this include the crop factor? I should be, I should be more clear on that. It's a good question, Brian. This is, this focal length here is a full frame equivalent. So if you have a crop factor of 1.5, then you take your 24 millimeter lens and apply your 1.5 crop factor, get a 35 millimeter lens roughly, and then use that. Not the, uh, not the, you know, the, the pre-crop factor uh, version of that. So that's, that's how that works. So it, it, it doesn't, it, this is a, just for a full frame, a full frame equivalent focal length. That's what that's for. All right, so, um, so the, the, what's the point here? Well, the point is, let's look at this for a second. So what you see here in this example is, this is every possible shutter speed and ISO you could possibly imagine using in night photography. And clearly in downtown Minneapolis, whoops, um, let's go back one here, click back, there we go. In downtown Minneapolis, if you look in the upper left, 20 seconds at ISO 12,800, totally overexposed. I mean, hopelessly, completely beyond hope, beyond uh, anything. But then as you start you know, decreasing the shutter speed and decreasing the ISO, things start to look a little bit better. So for example, you might say, okay, 6,400 ISO for half a second, that looks okay. But now check this out and look carefully. It's because you're all photographers and you'll be able to see the trend here. Let's look at this one right here, 6,400.5, half a second. Well, if I say 6,400, that's kind of a high ISO. What happens if I go to 3,200 and double the amount of time? So this should be 0 0.6 seconds and you know 1.3. So basically every diagonal has the same, if you look at like a, 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 a diagonal from top right to lower left, there's different diagonals that have these identical overall exposure, just different combinations of shutter speed and ISO. Hold that in your mind for a second. Downtown Minneapolis. Okay, how about if we go out into the, uh, you know, uh, into the into the farm, you know, uh, the rural uh, sites. These are, this is a suburban site actually. So this was downtown Minneapolis. This is um, suburban. All of a sudden things look a little different. This is what a dark location looks like. And this is in Kanab, Utah, Escalante, Utah. It's, it's very, very dark. And what you see here is that you really need to have the high ISO and the long shutter speeds. And this is all, all of these were done at f2.8. So this is kind of the issue is that a lot of times night photographers will talk about, um, you know, oh, you have to have a, you know, 20 second shutter speed, 
50, 30 second shutter speed, ISO 12,800, F2.8. Well, that's fine if you're working out here in the middle of nowhere, but if you're in a suburban location, you're gonna get things that are way overexposed and it's gonna be very, very confusing. So my advice is to, you know, just start look, shooting and um, look at the histogram. So what's the deal with that? So the histogram, this, this is what you wanna see. And you wanna have as much of an exposure as you can. So expose as, with your histogram as much to the right. And the key thing, I don't know if you can see it. If you look clear, carefully, if you look closely, this arrow is pointing at a little gap between the leftmost vertical axis and the, uh, the data in the histogram. So conversely, this is bad. This is, you don't see a gap. The left, the histogram is shoved all the way to the left. The reason I'm mentioning this is that when you are in the field at night and you look at this image of the Milky Way, this hidden behind where it says no gap, but if you look at that image of the Milky Way with your dark adapted eyes, it's going to look pretty good. It's probably, in fact, going to look just fine. And you know, most people, when they see this on their LCDs display at night in the dark, it's like, oh, that's way too bright. We need to bring, bring that down. It's like, well, hang on a second. Let's look at the histogram and make sure we're we're not underexposing it because as you probably know, if it's underexposed, it's a lot harder to bring it up in uh, post-processing and get a reasonable image. So something to think about there. Anyway, so keep an eye on that histogram. Now here's a few things that are nice to have is a loop for focusing. This is basically a magnifying glass. You can uh, stick on the, um, uh, on the back of uh, your camera. If you hear footsteps overhead, it's my kids, it's bedtime, they're trying to avoid their mom, it's not a hostage situation, everything's fine. Anyway, so sorry about that. Um, uh, loop is a great thing to have. You can really zoom in on the back of your LCD to focus on the stars to see this. Um, these remote shutter releases are wonderful things to have for a variety of reasons. I mean, I'm sure you all have these things that plug into your camera body and you can, uh, you know, less vibration. Uh, you can program them for uh, the programmable ones on the right there. You can program those to uh, uh, give you, um, you know, a time lapse uh, a set of images or for star trails, for example, but you don't need them for star trails. Now, this is one that's maybe not super obvious. I, I was blown away when I first saw this. This is, it's literally called the Tiffin Double Fog 3 filter. I don't know if there's a Double Fog 2. I don't know if there's a Single Fog 3. I don't know any of that. All I know is a Tiffin Double Fog 3 filter is the one to get, and it's great. Because what it does, you can see, you know, the top and bottom, you know, the same shot, literally seconds apart. I just literally hold this thing in front of my camera. Um, and in fact, these days I have a square version. It's right here. I can, you know, after we're done, I'll, I'll you know, you can see what it looks like. Uh, it's basically like frosted glass. And um, it just diffuses the stars in a way that produces this really nice effect. So bookmark that. Uh, compass, never leave home without it. It doesn't have batteries, never gonna fail you. Sometimes it can be a genuine lifesaver. And stabilizing your tripod. This is one way to do it to hang your camera bag. But these days I really like these stone bags. These are like $15 or something on Amazon. And they just Velcro to the, you know, different, your tripod legs. You can throw stuff. You can throw rocks in there or sand or a gallon of water or whatever you want. You're also really handy for when you're setting up your gear, just putting stuff in there. Um, so yeah, and then they just, there's fabric. So they just fold up. So that's a nice thing to have. And then this glow in the dark tape. I mean, it sounds like such an obvious thing, but it was years before I discovered this. And now all my tripods have a little piece of glow in the dark tape around them. They're, this is, I made this exposure super bright so you can see it, but especially if you set up, you know, a couple of different tripods in the dark wilderness, it makes it much easier to find uh, late at night or early in the morning. Now, uh, I thought I'd mention a, a star tracker because you're going to hear people talk about this. And again, you do not need this, especially when you're shooting at, you know, 50 to 70 millimeter lenses and lower. All that these things do is they track the sky. Is they literally, it's a motor and they just literally lock onto the sky and as the sky moves, it, the, the camera, the tracker allows the camera to move with it. And so I don't think you're gonna be able to see this, but if you look very, very carefully, the left-hand column is on a stationary tripod with no tracking. The right-hand column is on a tracked, uh, using a tracker. And as you can see on the bottom right, that's a four minute expo, four minutes, four minutes on the bottom right. 
and the stars are pinpoint. They're not, I mean, the, the foreground is completely blurry, ways to deal with that, but the stars are not, they're very sharp. So you can, the benefit of this is again, if you think about your exposure relationships, if you increase the shutter speed, you can really decrease the ISO. So uh, there it is. So at, what astrophotographers do is they have like a, you know, four minute exposure at ISO 800 instead of a 20 second exposure at ISO 12,800. So that's what trackers do. It's a whole level uh, layer of complexity. But um, I, I think what I want to do now is just talk real briefly about planning apps. And this is, again, sort of in the gear uh, type of thing. And just briefly, um, I do want to introduce you to apps for planning, especially night photography, because so much um, you'll be so much more uh, productive and it'll be a lot more fun if you know what you're going to see before you go out. Um, in this case, I have spent quite a bit of time uh, actually collaborate um, with the Planet Pro team, and I've helped them create a variety of uh, tutor free you know, YouTube videos on how to use the app. So I want to make that clear up front. But photographers, ephemeris on the left, photopills, I'm sure you've heard about photopills and Planet Pro. They're all great apps. And so uh, but I'm just going to give you some examples from the Planet Pro app because it has this, it, it basically turns your smartphone into a virtual camera. What I mean by that is you can pick a spot on a map as to where you want to go. You know, if it's in Big Sur, for example, if someone was talking about Big Sur or you know, Landscape Arboretum, if you're going to go to Iceland or Utah uh, or anywhere, you can find the map, it's a Google map. You can say, I'm gonna put my camera exactly here. You can zoom in on the map. I mean, you really zoom in right down to the stone where you're gonna stand. And then you can create these representations of different structures. Uh, for example, the barn. And then you can pick a focal length. Look at this, it says right here, 500 millimeters. On this date, February 8th, 2020, at this precise time at 514 minutes and 57 seconds, it's predicting the moon's gonna be right here. And if you look very carefully, you might even be able to see the surface features on the moon that match with the actual surface features on the moon. It's just incredible. So that's that example. This is uh, another a moon image over um, Mount Whitney. This is this this image was actually from uh, ten years ago in 2012, and I was just recreating it. Um, the date's all wrong, but nonetheless, there it is. And this is how I planned this shot. So I actually created a um, a. a representation of the arch. I went to the ranger station and got the dimensions of the arch, et cetera, et cetera. And here it is. And sure enough, that's what ended up happening. It was precisely as the uh, the app predicted it to happen. Star trails, you can do this. So here's a, this is Ellingson Island in Split Rock Lighthouse State Park. I was standing due north of the island. So in this case, the, you know, the stars still make the circles, but the north celestial pole is below the horizon. So all we see are the tops of the circles. So they're kind of arches right up there. So anyway, and you can actually see that represented in the, in the app. And um, you can see, here's this, you know, Death Valley National Park. This is a prediction for what the, uh, whoops, the lagoon, oh shoot, the Lagoon Nebula looks like. And it also is a little bit of a plug here. Here's my website. And if you go to where it says, on the upper left where it says learn, at the bottom here, you can find a, a link to the planet tutorial. So there's a whole bunch of free tutorials. There's like 20 of them. And right now I'm in the process of working with them to completely uh, update those. Uh, it's been about two or three years since we did the first set. So you can go to that page and um, I, I guess here, okay, here it is. So this is the page, that's some screenshots and you're like setting the camera pins, how to use the viewfinders, that virtual viewfinder, all kinds of stuff. So check that out. It's, you know, I think you'll you'll get a big kick out of that. Uh, that's right. Okay, so let's now talk about focusing at night. I mentioned this was so important. And on the left is what an unfocused star looks like. And on the right is what a focused star looks like. So um, the only way to do this at night is to use the live view on your LCD screen. And you have to find a bright star and focus on it. There's other ways to do it. That's the best way, in my opinion. Um, a plan B is to autofocus on something during the day. Autofocus on something during. I'll say it again. Autofocus on something during the day. Tape your focus ring and then switch it over to manual focus. And then you're usually pretty good to go. Actually, 
I mean, when you say autofocus on something, not just something, but focus on something really far away, like a cloud or the horizon, and um, that'll get you a good uh, a good part of the way there. But um, the focusing issue, I, I mean, let me just I'll, I'll tell you my, uh, my my Australia story of focusing if we have time uh, towards the end. It depends on how much time we uh, we go with there. And then composing at night is another uh, key issue that is um, tricky. So this is what the camera sees. Here's a, uh, an, uh, uh, an image, if you will, of Orion over Balanced Rock in, in uh, Arches National Park. It's a really cool place to go. And OK, that's what the camera sees. But when I look through the viewfinder, I pretty much see this. I don't necessarily see those stars. They're too dim. My viewfinder is this big. If I have a mirrorless camera with an electro, uh, electronic viewfinder that can help, uh, but even then, I'm not guaranteed of being able to see the actual foreground um, at all. So what? Here's here's the trick, the workaround that I would recommend. Uh, so the key thing is, okay. So okay, the, what's the point here? The point is, I want that star Bellatrix in the composition. So if I look at this, I mean, this is the here's the composition. Here's the constellation of Orion. This whole thing right here. If this star is not there, I've 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 clipped out part of Orion, and I can't see that star, Bellatrix. I mean, when I look through my viewfinder, it's just not there. So how do I know that I've got that in there, other than take a bunch of shots and, and confirm it, which is not a bad idea. What I do is I say, well, okay, when I'm looking, I can see Bellatrix, and I look at it, you know, just with my unaided eye. And there it is. How far is that above that rock? So I, I estimate. I just sort of gauge that distance in my head. And then I say, okay, well, I want it. I, what else do I got? Well, that's how wide Orion is. Okay, that's good to know. Well, look, that, and in this particular instance, Balanced Rock is about the same height as Bellatrix is above where I want it to be. So when I go over to the right and I look at the viewfinder, I just adjust my camera up and down until, you know, I have at least this amount of height visible you know, in my viewfinder. So even though I can't see the star, I know that where the position of this uh, rock is, I should be pretty much good to go. So I, this is a little bit kind of abstract and I don't know if that made a lot of sense, but let's talk, uh, as we start to wind things down and go into the, uh, the Q and A session, um, let's talk about the myriad of things that can go wrong between concept to image. And I've listed just a few of them here. You know, I forget something. Like I, I literally forget something. Like my memory card, my headlight battery dies. I have dust on my lens. I have dust on my sensor. I have a loose tripod. There's so many things that can screw things up, and it's so frustrating. But boy, when everything does come together, uh, it's just so rewarding and uh, exciting. So, let me give you a few of my like uh, you know highlights real of things that have gone wrong in the recent past. I thought this might be kind of fun because, you know, every, I've shown you a bunch of stuff that looks wonderful, but, you know, <laughs> here's one where, I don't know if you can see this, this was on a workshop and I was uh, getting, I had this group of students next to me. I was like, look at this. We can get the reflection of the setting crescent moon right here in this little puddle of water. And I was so excited. I obviously bumped my, uh, my focus ring and I was out of focus. And I was horrified when I went back later and scroll. I was like, oh, this is gonna be a great image. It's like, no, it's not. It's <laughs> it's completely out of focus. So it happens, you know, it just, it, 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 you know, it's just a, what can you do? You, you can't fix that. Um, this was actually ironically from the uh, the, the same, uh, within minutes of that other shot, this was at Mono Lake, Mono Lake in California near Yosemite National Park. This was doing an annual workshop I do with Bob Actifreshi uh, with, with Nat Geo. And in this example, you see these headlights coming towards us. This was um, this some people who just, you know, we were saying, hey, doing a night photography shot over here. And they were night photographers and they just didn't leave their, they kept their headlights on. And it was like a little infuriating, but it was kind of funny because, um, you know, I was just gonna roll with it, but then kind of a funny story. There was <laughs> one of the students in the workshop uh, these so these structures you see here are called tufas, T-U-F-A, and they're um, some sort of calcium carbonate. It's a, a mineral deposit that used to be the lake used to be above us, 
But just like everything in California, the water level has receded and they've exposed these uh, really cool sort of otherworldly um, uh, structures. They're, they're like, you know, they're huge. I'm telling you, you know, 20, 30 feet tall, well, I don't know, like 30 feet. Anyway, they call it tufas. And so one of my students was, is this group of people were coming towards us. And one of the students would say, hey, uh, you know, well, they're chatting, you know, and they said, well, just, just be careful of the tufa snakes. And the group was like, what, the what? And I was like, what? <laughs> he said, yeah, the tufa snakes, you know, they, uh, yeah, they, they're really got to watch out for the tufa snakes. They come out at night. And in fact, they're really attracted to bright headlights. Click. <laughs> I thought that was a pretty, never occurred to me to say that. It seemed a little bit cruel in retrospect, but nonetheless, it was, it was effective. But anyway, so bright headlights, fog. This is another one. Um, so the way to get around this is you wrap uh, disposable hand warmers around your, your lens. And uh, that does a pretty good job of keeping things warm enough that you don't get fog and frost, particularly in the wintertime when it's so humid. You, you don't think of things being humid in the wintertime, but it really is, as the temperature drops, the dew point changes in such a way that frost easily forms, especially on lenses. And so uh, I've got a lot of great time lapses of fog forming <laughs> before I really adopted the trick of using disposable hand warmers. Law enforcement. This is another one where fortunately I had a permit to be uh, where I was, but a uh, very pleasant exchange. And most of the time people are very curious about what you're photographing and what you're, uh, you know, uh, looking at in the night sky. And so uh, it happens, you know, you just got to, you just got to be aware of that and be ready for it when it, when it does happen. How about this one? I was doing this time lapse, <coughs> excuse me, and this moth decided to land on my lens and it stayed there for like a really long time. I was like, Moth, you got to get out of there. But um, you can also see a little bit of fog here for me. But what can you do? You know, you're out there and these are some soybean uh, fields um, down near uh, Albert Lee. So if, uh, speaking of which, you can, this is a pretty good place to, if you go south of the metro, you can see the um, Milky Way pretty well because you're facing south and the metro lights are behind you. So you can get some surprisingly good visibility in those locations. So that's something to, and this was kind of a classic. Here, I, here I am in Death Valley National Park. I actually hiked into this location. It's a couple miles. There's just no trails. You just go to the spot. I was so excited because I was going to do this time lapse from where the moon was going to rise. You know, <laughs> the moon was going to rise over the eastern horizon and I was going to illuminate this beautiful, you know, desert scene. And, um, I hadn't really thought that my tripod shadow was going to be right in the direction where I was aiming my camera. So I learned this lesson vividly from this example because it was ruined. Fortunately, I had a second camera pointing due south and that one was fine. But just be aware of the fact that if you do do a time lapse um, session at night and the moon's going to rise, think about where your various shadows are going to fall. I mean, if I was, if there were a bunch of trees, which there are not, but if this were in Minnesota, I could hide behind a tree. So I'm in the tree shadow you know, that sort of thing would be just fine. So here's some best practices real quick. Um, when you're around other people, just try not to use your cell phone, basically, or a white flashlight or any other thing that gives off a white light because it wrecks uh, people's night vision. Um, converse of that is try to only use a red headlamp. And when you're using a red handle, this is a little bit hard to explain, but especially if you're with other people facing the same direction, if you have to use it, see if you can face it in the direction away from where everyone's shooting because that red light really goes out quite a ways and can show up in other people's images. Dim the LCD screen on your cameras. It's a great way to save your battery life, to save your eyes and keep everybody happy. Uh, you can, if your camera has like little green indicator lights that go off every time you take an exposure, consider taping over that with some, you know, tape to make it you know, not visible, so that if there's other people, those little lights don't show up in their shots. And uh, if you're, again, around other people, see if you can park your headlight vehicle so that if you leave, or when you leave, your lights don't shine too much through the scene. It's a little bit unavoidable, um, but just something to think about. And also, if you're, again, with a group, see if you can set your interior lights to stay off. So when you open your car doors, the whole thing doesn't light up. Because, uh, again, those lights really do... Um, so the first night under the stars, what's going to happen? Make sure you got your camera battery, your memory card. <laughs> I have myself, I now carry a, just a separate battery and a separate memory card that just stays in my pack because I have, I've, I've, a couple of times I've gone on location 
I forgot to put a memory card in my back in my camera. I didn't have any memory cards in my battery bag, in my camera bag. And so I had an, <laughs> I was able to enjoy some astronomy of visual observing. Uh, make sure you've got your red headlight. I would recommend arriving an hour before sunset to get everything set up. It's just a bummer, especially your first few nights to do it in the dark. Make sure your tripod is tightened securely. It's amazing how many, um, how many uh, you know, things can be loose on a tripod. The base plate on your camera, the actual ball head connector to the tripod, the swivel plate, there's just a bunch of things that can go wrong. Check your settings, check your focus, get your shot and email me, Mike at Mike Shaw Photography with your story. I'd love to hear about it. So just, this is always something to keep in mind. This is my website again. I do workshops. Um, this is, I'm a full-time, that's why I do full-time. I'm a full-time night photography teacher. I'm one of the small group of people that that's what we do and this, we love doing it. Um, got different books. This is last year's slide, uh, whoops. Uh, if you go to my website, I've got a bunch of really cool uh, workshops going on right now. Some of them are full, some of them are still open. That's my learn tab um, on my website. Uh, my computer decided to freeze, not helpful, but nonetheless, oh, there we go. Let's go back to that. Oh, we got another one. Okay, here we go. So this is Split Rock Lighthouse. We're going to end on this. This is my final thing. So night photography, you're looking at Split Rock Lighthouse. As you're looking through the night, just always remember that you are an astronaut. You know, your view of space that you capture with your camera, that you see with your eyes, it's the same view that the astronauts have. And when you get a chance to see those, uh, those, those distant objects that are, you know, unfathomably far distances away, the light has traveled, you know, from hundreds to thousands of years in the past to reach you. Um, it's just, a, it's just a, 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 a point we're thinking. So I'm going to stop here. And if you have any questions about any aspect of things, um, oh yeah, these are my social. So Instagram, Twitter, uh, I have a Facebook page. It's at Mike Shaw Photography. I love uh, being in touch. And obviously, if you have questions or anything like that, glad to help. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen at this point and open the floor up to, uh, to questions. Again, happy to answer anything. Mike, Steve here. Thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, I do have a question. You, you, As far as a tripod, you specified a specific kind of tripod head a ball head i don't have a ball tripod head does that matter that much or? not at all no huh i okay. mean yeah i mean you can actually you don't even need a tripod you can set your camera on rocks or one time i was doing a thing in france i forgot my tripod so i spent the, i just like to wedge it under a tree uh so no you can use a if you have like a, one of these three axis type things or two axis landscape head just fine at, you know you yeah totally fine thanks other questions? If you have questions, you're muted. Um, well, thank you, Jill. I got the- uh, Mike, Mike got um, one, yeah. one, just a quick one. Um, how do you deal with, uh, with, some, with the noise when you use such high um, ISOs that you're using? Oh, that's such a good question. Thank you for asking that. So the question is, when you're shooting at ISO 12,800 or 6,400, even 3,200, you are going to have noise. And what is noise? So noise is an artifact that the, your camera produces that's a pain in the neck. And it manifests itself as follows. If I have a perfect, if I have a gray card, perfectly uniform gray sheet of paper or card, and I photograph that, it should be uniformly gray. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me, at high ISO, it's not. If I look at each individual pixel, some pixel be, will be brighter or darker than others. And it's just an electronic variation. It's a statistical fluctuation. Nothing you can do about it. Nothing you can do about it intrinsically. It's just how it appears and it's exacerbated at high ISOs. So when you're at high SOs, especially at high, and also high temperatures, by the way. So if you're in uh, Death Valley National Park in the summertime, it's painful because you can have so much. Um, it's, it's physically painful, first of all, but also painful to see all the noise in your, uh, in your images, excuse me. 
So what do you do about it? Well, there's there's also there's there's the, the luminance noise, the the uh, the, uh, the salt and pepper type effect with the different grayscale levels. But then you also have uh, color noise. You know, each, as you know, each pixel is actually red, green, and blue, three subpixels, and each of those have different levels of brightness. So you can get these like little red patches and little pink patches and green and blue. It's really weird. So what do you do about that? Well, there's two things you can do. The easiest thing is well, actually three things at least, but the easiest things is you just go to Lightroom and or Photoshop and you use the you know, the uh, camera raw or the develop module in Lightroom and just adjust the luminance sliders to and the sharpening you can bring the sharpening down in, and play with the luminance sliders to decrease the noise and you know, just like everything else in photography you kind of you get you give something up when you uh, when you do that and um, you, uh, the thing that you give up sometimes is a little detail because you're kind of smoothing out the detail. So there's, it's easy to go too far with that. But nonetheless, that's the easiest way to go. There's another um, very popular and powerful uh, plugin called Topaz you know, Denoise. And there's Topaz several things, but Topaz Denoise that's very good at getting rid of noise as well. And that's sort of a separate um, program that plugs into mm -hmm. Photoshop. The mm -hmm. third way is involves a little bit more work on your end um, in the field, but it works very, very well. And what you do is you just take multiple images of the same thing. Let's say, when I say multiple, I mean like 10 or 20. And so if you take 10 or 20 sequential images, each one of those images, if you look at an individual pixel, will have a slightly different, you know, let's say brightness level because of this noise issue. But what you can do is you can take those 20, let's say you have 20 images and you can either put them into Photoshop as an image stack, or you can run them through a, a, as a free software for, uh, called Sequitor for a PC. You can get a program called Starry Landscape Stacker or Starry Sky Stacker for the Mac. But what these programs do and the, the process in Photoshop does is it takes each individual pixel, pixel in the 20 images and averages it. And when you average each pixel, you effectively get rid of the noise because you're just getting the average. So it goes pixel by pixel. So if you think of that gray sheet, that gray card, if it looks at each pixel in the gray card and averages each pixel, you're gonna get the average gray color pretty much, especially if you have a lot of, of images. And sometimes mm -hmm. astrophotographers will take a lot of images you know, mm -hmm. um, to do that, but uh, it's an effective way to go. And again, it's sort of a matter of your personal preference because yes, if it's, very high temperatures, very high ISO. It can be really a bummer, but you know, the cameras are getting pretty good. And, you know, if I think back even three or four generations ago with my Nikon, I, I couldn't shoot at 6,400 at night. It was just out of the question. And now I routinely shoot at 12,800. I mean, I have, you know, dozens of images in, in my books that are shot at 12,800 and they're just fine, you know, because uh, cameras have gotten so much better. So it's not as bad as you might think. Thank you. Yeah, it's a good question. And I see that, uh, is that Betty Bryan? Uh, do I have a new book coming out? I do. I just, uh, I'm in the final throws. I've submitted it. I've submitted the text and the images and I'm proofreading the chapters right now. The publishers have sent them back to me. They've been copy edited. So this is my last chance to catch any mistakes before they go to press. And it's going to come out, I think, in print uh, sometime this summer, early fall. It's called, and that's called the complete, no, sorry. The Beginner's Guide to Landscape, no, sorry. The Beginner's Guide to Astrophotography. <laughs> I gotta get the title straight. Super excited about it. It was Rocky Nook in uh, San Rafael. Thanks for the great comments in the chat too, by the way. Any other questions? Well, I think we'll wrap it up then. Thank you, Mike. This has been great. Um, I've got this recorded, so I'll post it on our uh, YouTube channel. And uh, perfect. Thank you much, everybody. I'm going to end the meeting. Thank you, Have Steve. Good night. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Terry, great to see you, and uh, Kelly, and everyone else. So thanks so much for the uh, coming this evening. Um, and keep in touch. Thanks.